my heart is steadfast, O oh God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. I will praise you, O oh Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the peoples. For great is your love, reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Be exalted, O oh God, above the heavens, and let your glory be over all the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, his love endures Endures forever for the life that's been reborn. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise forever. From the rising to the setting sun, his love endures forever. And by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Morning. Whoop, there it goes really loud again. All right. So what happens when I don't turn it on and then he tries to adjust it for me. My bad. Well, I'm glad that you're here this morning and we're looking forward to an exciting day as we worship together. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you for the privilege of being in this place today and we thank you for your faithfulness to us along the journeys of this life. Father, I pray as we come into this place today that you will speak to each one of our hearts, that you will help us to hear from you, 
and that we will leave this place changed. In your name we pray, amen. And you may be seated. We do have a number of announcements this morning. Uh, first of all is our uh, baby bottle fundraiser for Crisis Pregnancy Center. Today is the day that the bottles are due, so if you brought your bottle back, that's great. If you didn't, next week is all right. Just uh, turn it in at the office. So if you brought one this morning, you can turn that in in the office. Um, immediately following our morning service today, we will have our annual, elect or our annual meeting for a church, and this is, uh, it's a quick meeting, but it's just a meeting where we kind of summarize what's happened in the church in the last year. Uh, for those who are members of the church, there is the elections taking place in the foyer. A uh, young adult group will meet, I had to cancel last week, so this week they will meet Tuesday at Jimmy and Leah's home. So if you've got any questions, you can see Jimmy and Leah about that, and uh, they'll get you directions if you would like to attend that. All right. Well, our background this morning and let's see if I can pull that up, just the background. No, well, apparently not. Our background this morning is just a road. Now, did anybody travel roads like this when they were growing up? Because when I was growing up, I grew up way out in the country, and pavement was one of those things that was sophisticated, and we didn't have that stuff. It was the gravel roads with just the grass growing up in the middle. And as, as we looked at our reading this week, we're looking at the journey kind of the culmination of the journey that the Apostle Paul has taken across his life. We're reading in 2 Timothy Paul's last letter. These are his dying words to a true son, someone he loved very deeply. And so we're going to be talking in our message about um, that friendship, that journey that they have been on, Paul and Timothy. But as we worship today, I just want you to be thinking about the journey that God has had you on. Where has God taken you in your life? What are the paths that you have traveled? Who are the friends and the loved ones that God has brought into your life along the way? In my office, I have a wall of memories. It's actually my diplomas and my ordination certificate. But I don't put them up there so I can look at them and say, wow, look what I've accomplished. I, I put them up there so I can look and say, I remember the journey that led to that piece of paper. And so for my associate's degree from the Bible college, I remember how immature, how young I was. For my bachelor's degree at the Bible college, I can remember what God taught me in that last year at the Bible college. For my master's degree, I can remember what God taught me in, in Nebraska as I accepted my first pastorate and realized I didn't remember anything from Bible college because I wasn't the greatest student there. And so I had to go back to school to try to figure, well, how, am I, how do I do this? But I remember the journey, and then my ordination certificate, which in the Nazarene church is a very special thing, and I remember how sacred that night was, and then my doctoral, doctorate degree, the, the diploma, and just remembering the journey that I've taken just since I've been here in Davenport. We're all on journeys. We all take journeys, and, and, and we, we look at our lives, we see, we see these, these differences, but but sometimes we need to stop and process the journey. So as we worship this morning, we're going to talk about the friendship that God offers to us as we worship. We're going to talk about the relationship that He offers to us as He travels with us. But I want you to allow your mind to wander a little bit, to process the journey that God has had you on, to bring you to this day, to this point, to see His faithfulness, to see the ways that He has spoken to you in conviction, but also the ways that He has spoken to you in His love. And let's journey together as we continue to worship. Let's stand. Who am I that you
us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Sing it out. Here we go. He loves us. Isn't it amazing how songs speak to our journey? You know, as, as we sang through that set of songs this morning, and I, I can think back to the first time that I heard that first song. I, I can think of the first time I heard the second song, How He Loves. It was at church camp and teen camp in Nebraska, asking myself, what in the world am I doing here? What did I volunteer for this week? But this song that... that just stuck with me. And then what a friend we have in Jesus. I, I can remember as a boy learning harmony on songs like What a Friend We Have in Jesus. That book that gathers dust in front of us. The hymnal that learning to read the music. And yet I can remember that even though I grew up on that song, it wasn't until many years later when we were in Colorado Springs that the words finally hit me. It is, the line that hit me was, oh, what, what uh, peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in, in prayer. And of course, it hit me in the midst of one of those situations where I had not prayed, I had acted first and then made a mess. And It's amazing how songs speak into our journey. 
It's amazing how God uses music. It's amazing how God uses places. He uses smells. He uses memories. This morning as we come to this time of prayer, knowing that we're all at different points on our journey, some of us this week are in the midst of a journey that seems so overwhelming that we just don't see that there's a way through it. And yet some of us this week are in the midst of a journey at a point of our journey where things are so exciting And it's a matter of saying that we have the same God who is able to meet all of us no matter where we're at today. We're going to sing through this song again or finish the third verse, I think. And as we sing through this, this song again, our altars are open if you would like to come forward or if you would like to be seated if you want to remain standing. But I just want you to take a few moments to process your journey in prayer. Where you're at, where God has brought you from. If the journey feels so overwhelming, just cry out to God. If the journey is so exciting, then share that excitement with God. But as we sing through this, let's remember that He is our friend on this journey. Heavenly Father, this morning we come before You so thankful for Your hand upon our journey. So thankful as we look back across our lives, the situations that we thought we weren't going to make it through. And You brought us through each one of those. And yet recognizing that for many in this room today, You're at a spot on this journey where it feels like you're not going to make it again. But regardless of where we find ourselves on this journey, it is so awesome to know that we have such a great friend in Jesus. A friend who loves us, who knows us, and loves us still. A friend who walks with us when no one else will listen. A friend who never leaves us or forsakes us when it feels like everyone else has abandoned us. What an awesome privilege for us to have this friend in Jesus. And Father, as we gather in this place this morning, I know that many in this room are overwhelmed. And we want to take a moment of silent prayer just to lift up those concerns that are weighing heavily upon our hearts today. Father, for those who are struggling with physical needs, their health concerns, health concerns of loved ones. For those who are struggling with financial concerns. 
for those who are struggling with relationship issues, marriages, relationships with children, relationships with parents. For those who are struggling in trying to find purpose in life, we lift these needs to You and we thank You that You hear us when we pray. Father, we are so grateful to serve such an awesome God who loves us, who truly is that friend when everything else falls apart. We're thankful that you love us so deeply. As the song we sang earlier said that his love is a hurricane and we are a tree bending beneath the weight of his love and mercy. Father, I pray that you'll help us this morning to receive your love to strengthen us for the journey. And Father, we also recognize this morning and we are, we are excited with the many blessings that you have provided in our lives. For some who are here this morning, they're in the midst of very exciting days. And we take time to praise you and thank you. And Lord, it's not just when we're in the midst of the exciting days that we have things to thank you for. And so for all of us this morning, even if we're deep, deep in the throes of despair, there are things that we can be thankful for, and we want to take a moment to silently lift up our thanksgivings and our praises this morning. In the midst of all that we have to be thankful for, we are so thankful for your peace that comes in the midst of our chaos. Thank you that you love us and care for us. As we close this time of prayer this morning, we find great comfort and great joy in praying together the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And you may be seated. This next song that we're going to sing, it's a short chorus, but one of the things that I've found on my journey is that no matter how overwhelming it seems, He's still God. He is still Lord no matter how overwhelmed life may get. So let's sing together, He is Lord. He is Lord. And He is Lord. And He
Will you stand with us as we continue to worship? Waiting here for you. If faith can move the mountains, let the mountains move. We come with expectation, waiting here for you.
Our ushers will come forward at this time. We'll continue to worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings. Mike, would you pray for our offering this morning? Lord, thank you for being with us in your Holy Spirit. Thank you for our fellowship together and for all that you do for everyone in this world every day in every way. Please bless our offering today. For all power, honor, praise, and glory is yours forever. Amen. Amen. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. And I'd rather have Jesus than have. Thank you to our worship team this morning. We all have a story. I keep looking at this picture of this road and remembering there was actually a, a family farm that my grandmother owned along with her brothers and sisters that the road to get to the farm was very much like this. I can remember all the the memories that we made as we played in the creek when I was growing up and back when it was, you know, you'd all pile in the back of a pickup truck. You know, that's illegal now, I think, but we'd get about 20 of us in the back of a pickup truck and we all have a story. We all have a story. We, we all come from somewhere and we're all going somewhere. And the book that we're reading this week, Second Timothy, is recognizing this story for the Apostle Paul is coming to an end. But he wants to take some time in the beginning to give thanks and to remember. Let's read together. Timothy, I thank God for you. The God I serve with a clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted, and I will be filled with joy when we are together again. 
I remember your genuine faith, for you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know the same faith continues strong in you. That is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Did you catch Paul's remembering? This is his last letter. Paul has written a number of letters and in all honesty, about half of the New Testament is owed to Paul or those that he influenced. But this is the last one, Second Timothy. Now, in case you're wondering, the New Testament is not organized chronological, chronologically. In fact, once we finish Second Timothy, we're going to read another letter that Paul wrote, actually two more, Titus and Philemon. The New Testament, just as an aside, is organized. The Gospels come first. And then they're organized by Paul's letters in the length. So the longest ones come first. So Romans, then 1 Corinthians. They put 2 Corinthians with it even though it's not the longest, but they kind of go through in length. And then they start up with Peter's writings and then John's writings to conclude the New Testament. That's extra today. You didn't pay for that. When Paul writes this letter, he has been imprisoned in Rome for the second time. Now, the book of Acts ends telling the narrative of Paul's story with Paul imprisoned in Rome in really kind of this, this house arrest that's not so bad for him. As he's in prison in Rome the first time, he has this constant stream of guests that are coming and visiting him. It's a very lighthearted attitude. For Paul, this is when he writes the, the letter to the Philippians. And for Paul, it's a great time because he has this house, this constant stream of visitors, and even when all the visitors are gone, he has guards chained to him. And for somebody like Paul who liked to talk, there's no better thing than having a captive audience. And so Paul's letters that he writes from his first imprisonment really are positive and exciting and joyful. But this letter is not the same imprisonment. Although the New Testament doesn't tell us, most scholars and from the early church writings, the, the books that were written that were not considered sacred and not included in Scripture, but were included, were kept so that we could have records, all show that Paul got out of prison that time and took another journey. He took a journey, we believe he went to Spain, but we know that he went back around to visit the churches that he had been in. He left Timothy in Ephesus. He'd left Titus, I believe, in Crete. So he, he's gone on this journey, but then he gets arrested the second time. The second imprisonment in Rome is intense. This is where the emperor Nero has called for Paul's arrest because he's arresting all Christians and he plans to destroy the Christian faith. And so he, Nero does a, a ton of atrocities to Christians. So he will dress them up in sheep's clothing and make them walk into the arena with a pack of wolves and watch them be devoured. That's entertainment for them. One of Nero's favorites was to take Christians and tie them to a stake and light them on fire to light his dinner parties. There are many other things that Nero would do to the Christians, but this period is very intense. And so Nero gathered together all of the Christian leaders that he could find at the time Peter and Paul, we believe, were both imprisoned in Rome at the same time, very likely sharing the same prison cell. And their death is near. Paul knows that he will not survive this imprisonment. And he alludes to that numerous times throughout this letter. He knows that death is imminent. In fact, there's a couple of pieces in the later part of the book that you almost wonder if he hears prison or the guard's footsteps and wonders if they're coming for him now. When we read the book of 2 Timothy, we have to read this book from the mindset that this is a man who knows that death is near, and this is what he wants Timothy to know. Now, a part of the point of this letter is he's begging Timothy to come to him quickly. 
but he writes this letter knowing that Timothy may not make it in time. This letter is much more personal than it is professional. In 1 Timothy, we we see this, this side of Paul where he's really giving professional guidance to Timothy. He's he's trying to say, this is how you need to make sure that the church is organized. This is how you need to make sure this is being taken care of. This is how you handle the the widows. This is how you handle the orphans. This is how you handle those who want to be leaders in the church. It's, It's professional. With this letter, it's personal. It's that last letter from a spiritual father to a spiritual son. Paul is saying his goodbye in case Timothy doesn't make it. And so we start this letter with this this time to remember. Paul is reflective as he awaits his execution. He's remembering his own story and he's remembering Timothy's story and how those two stories intersected. He's very thankful for their relationship. Paul, even though he never married, was very close to a number of followers of Jesus Christ, but Timothy was the closest. And he remembers. He remembers his own story, and I know that this is probably rehashing for some, but for some of you this may be kind of enlightening to see the Scripture was was written by somebody with a story. It wasn't just randomly written down and passed down. There's stories behind all the books of the Bible. So let's kind of reflect on Paul's story. But as we reflect on Paul's story, I want to say that many books have been written on the Apostle Paul. So what we're going to cover in one sermon is not going to be exhaustive. I just want us to kind of touch on some highlights. Uh, Yesterday, I did an Amazon book search. So I went to Amazon. I just typed books and search for the Apostle Paul in quotations, so it wouldn't give me other, it would just give me that phrase. And there are over 46,000 books written on the Apostle Paul in Amazon's library. Uh, Personally, I have over 50 books between print versions and digital copies. Over 50 books on the Apostle Paul. I did not read them all for this this sermon, just in case you're wondering. I did reread through several of them, but not all 50 of them. This is not going to be exhaustive, so I, you know, some of you may say, well, you didn't touch on this. Well, there's a lot to Paul, and, and we're not, we don't have time for all that, but let's remember his story. Paul was born, his Jewish name was Saul, and he, his name, we believe, was, they usually did it in, in a series. Now, we don't know his full name. We know the first part, which was Saul, typically the father's name would be the middle name, and then the last name would be Paulus, which is Paul. So he would have three names that he would use depending on where he was at. He starts out, when we first start to hear about Paul in the New Testament, we're reading about a young man named Saul. Because his story starts out in the Jewish circles, but as he started traveling, his name switches, and all of a sudden they just call him Paul. Now the New Testament doesn't explain why that transition was made, because, but it was because he was speaking not to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. He was born in Tarsus. Now Tarsus is not in Palestine. It is kind of up and around the Mediterranean a little bit. Um, it's, it's a very wealthy area. Um, in fact, in the day that Paul was raised there, Tarsus was viewed as more educationally elite than Athens. It had a university that was very well known in that time for being, it was one of the Ivy League schools. So for the Apostle Paul, when he was growing up, there was a great arrogance among the Jews or among the people from Tarsus that we really are smarter than anybody else in the known world. And it's interesting, if you, read, if you know that and you read what Paul has to say when he goes to Athens, there's kind of some humor in that where Paul talks about, I know how well educated you are. <laughs> You're not as educated as I am. He's a Jew from Tarsus. As a Jew, he was able to track his lineage and he knew what tribe he was from in the 12 sons of Israel. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, if you know the Old Testament story, you might remember that there was another Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. 
the first king of Israel was named Saul, and he was from the tribe of Benjamin. So there's an arrogance for Saul. <clears throat> Puff out a little bit, because I'm named after the first king of Israel. And he's my ancestor. So y'all ain't the, all that. There's, there's that arrogance. That's how we would say it in southern Indiana, but y'all ain't all that. I think when I was growing up, there was a contest to see how many times we could fit ain't into a sentence. He was a Hebrew born of Hebrews. He was as Jewish as you could get. Even though he grew up in Tarsus, everything that his family did was following all of the regulations as a Jew. He was educated in Tarsus first, but because he showed great potential, he was chosen to continue his education, to go to college, as you will, in Jerusalem. And he was educated at the feet of Gamaliel, who was the son of what the Jews in that era viewed as the greatest teacher in all of that era of history. So Paul had a pretty good education to start out in Tarsus and then to come to Jerusalem and train at the feet of Gamaliel was a very, very, uh, high, very lofty, very high level of education. And he became a Pharisee. In the Bible, we don't look very kindly at Pharisees. They were the legalists. They were the ones that drove everybody nuts. They were the ones that Jesus uh, gave the hardest time to because they were so consumed with looking right on the outside and yet inside they were just so corrupt. Paul fit that description. Paul was present. We first see his name show up when Stephen was martyred. Stephen wasn't the first martyr in the Christian church, but he was one of the early martyrs. And this, the book of Acts tells us that Paul was present or Saul was present and he held the coats. He was not going to be guilty of throwing a stone. It could have been that he didn't want to sweat that day or something, but, but he was present and gave his approval as Stephen was martyred. Here we go. There we go. And he kind of got the taste of blood after watching Stephen's death. And he started persecuting Christians throughout Jerusalem. And the book of Acts tells us that he would go into the house and haul both the mothers and the fathers off to jail and leave the children unattended. Because they were Christians. They were heretics. And he wanted to persecute. He, wanted, he tells us in some of his other letters that he even killed some of those that he drug off to jail. And when he chased them out of Jerusalem, and many Christians fled Jerusalem, then he decided, well, I'm enjoying this game. I'm going to keep chasing. And so he chased them outside of Jerusalem. And on one of these journeys to a place called Damascus, he met Jesus. Saul was on his way to Damascus with orders from the chief priest that he could go and arrest anybody who claimed to be a Christian. And just outside of town, he got knocked off his donkey. He was blinded by a bright light and a voice spoke to him, and the voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul's response was, Lord, Lord, who are you? And the voice said, I am Jesus, who are you are persecuting? And Saul's life would never be the same. There's a neat story that unfolds as, as Saul is blinded and he goes into the city and he sets for three days blind, not knowing exactly what happened, but knowing that something big just happened. And God sends, God speaks to a man named Ananias who is praying and says, you need to go over to the house of so-and-so. Saul is staying there and you need to pray over him. And Ananias, who knew Saul was coming because he knew that there was a warrant for his arrest, says, God, I'm not nuts. I ain't going over there. But God speaks and says, it's okay. Saul will find out how much he must suffer for my name. His life would never be the same. He converts to Christianity after coming face to face with Jesus Christ. And then he goes from there and spends three years in the desert. Now this is not documented in the book of Acts, but it is documented in the book of Galatians where Paul tells his story and says that after he was converted, he went and spent three years in the desert. 
Incidentally, we believe that was the Sinai Desert. If you remember back to the Old Testament, that's where Moses spent 40 years wandering, taking care of his father-in-law's sheep, and then brought the, the children of Israel out, and they spent 40 years in the same desert where he was, where Saul was able to spend time in the same desert of his forefathers knowing their stories very well and to be able to integrate the person of Jesus Christ into the Jewish training that he had received. And then he returns to Damascus to preach. As you can imagine, someone who had such a great reputation as a persecutor of the church, this sermon did not go very well. And his life is threatened and he has to be lowered through the city wall in a basket and he has to flee to Jerusalem. Now he goes back to Jerusalem one of those things you wonder what he was thinking because he's not going to be any better received there. And in fact, he's not because nobody wants him. The apostles are still afraid of this guy because of his history of destroying Christians and killing Christians. And yet the Jews want nothing to do with him because he's now preaching the same heresy that he once persecuted. And a man named Barnabas vouches for Saul. Now Barnabas is a man that we, we've heard of once before up to this point in the New Testament narrative. He was a man, after Christianity spread throughout Jerusalem, after 3,000 were saved, then 5,000 were saved, the book of Acts tells us that, that many people were selling their goods, their properties, and bringing the money to the apostles and saying, let's just help one another instead of all being consumed with what we have. And Barnabas, who was a native of Cyprus, sold his retirement property outside of Jerusalem. And he brought the money to the disciples. In fact, he's the only one other than Ananias and Sapphira who sold theirs and lied about it. He's the only one who donated that money in a positive way that is named in the New Testament. But because the apostles trusted Barnabas, when Barnabas brought Saul to them and says, this guy is genuine, they believed him. And so the apostles, at least a few of them, met with Saul and questioned him on his, his theology, his understanding of Jesus Christ. And then Paul leaves Jerusalem for Tarsus. And he goes back home. And we don't know exactly how long he was there, but he hangs out for a while. The church in Antioch starts to explode. Many good things are happening there. And so the apostles point Barnabas to go and lead this growing congregation. And Barnabas, once he gets there, sees how things are going. He says, you know what? Saul is wandering around somewhere up in Tarsus. I'm going to go get him. And so Barnabas goes and finds Saul and brings him back to help in Antioch. Not too long after they're there and the church is growing and things are going very well, the Lord calls Saul and Barnabas out of Antioch and He says, set them aside for Me. And so they start going on these journeys. Their first trip around the Mediterranean, it's not a great trip. They end up getting beaten a number of times. They end up uh, getting stoned and left for dead at one point in time. And right around that time, they go to a city named Lystra. And they convert a mother and a daughter by the name of Lois and Eunice. And Lois and Eunice are deeply impacted by the truth of the Gospel. And that message flows on to Eunice's son, a young man by the name of Timothy. Saul and Barnabas return to Antioch. And before they go out again on their second journey, they get into an argument and they end up splitting ways over Barnabas' nephew, John Mark. Now, John Mark, he's mentioned a few times in the New Testament. One of those times is in the book of 2 Timothy, where Paul says to Timothy, bring with you John Mark because he is valuable to me. But early in Paul's career as a missionary, he viewed John Mark as a traitor because John Mark had gone with them on the first journey. And a couple of stops into the journey, he decided he didn't like this and headed for home. So for Paul, 
He's thinking, I'm not taking John Mark again. The kid's a traitor. I'm not, I'm not having anything to do with him. And Barnabas, who encouraged, wanted to encourage John Mark the same way that he had encouraged Paul, says, we've got to give him a second chance. And finally it comes down to the point where Paul says, you can give him a second chance, but you can take him and go this way, and I'm going a different direction. And that's what happens. So Paul takes Silas, and they go to check on the churches around the land routes, and, Paul, or and Barnabas takes John Mark, and they go the sea route. We don't know when they connect again, but we know that by the end of Paul's life, John Mark is viewed very differently. When he comes through Lystra this time, he recruits Timothy to come with him and join him on this journey. He says... Come along, and I, I, want you to, I want you to learn. Now, he te- he, Paul completes a total of four missionary journeys that are recorded. There's another journey at least that is not recorded. And Timothy was a traveling companion with him on three of those four journeys. Paul has faced many difficulties throughout the years. But he knows that as he writes this letter, It's the end of the story. But just because one story ends, Paul knew that the Gospel was not going to end. Just because his life was coming to a conclusion, he knew that there was someone else who would take the baton and go forward. Paul believed that young man was Timothy. Timothy was a very young man when he joins the Apostle Paul. His mother and grandmother were Jews. And they believed the Gospel message that Paul preached. But his father was a Greek and was not a believer in Christ and not a God-fearing Greek either. And so in order for Timothy to come along with Paul, Timothy first has to go through the physical act of converting to Judaism. And so Timothy goes through this act of converting to Judaism so that he can travel with Paul. And he's a constant companion and co-worker with the Apostle Paul for the rest of Paul's life. I didn't do the count. I think there's only one or two letters that Paul wrote that does not specifically mention that Timothy is either with him or Timothy is the letter bearer. So, Timothy and Paul are working very closely together. I wish we knew more of Timothy's story, and I tried to look that up this week, and there's just not a lot known about him. But Paul placed Timothy in many leadership positions throughout the church. And he truly has become a son to Paul. Now, traveling in that day was very different than traveling in our day. I'm reading a book right now by uh, Dr. J. Martinson, who's a professor at Olivet, and he remembered a trip that he took when he was growing up from Wisconsin, where he lived, Green Bay, to Colorado Springs in a station wagon with his sister and no air conditioning. Now, some of you remember those journeys. I remember taking a trip with my brother in a Toyota Corolla from Indiana to Georgia with no air conditioning. And I can remember those fights that I had with my brother over space. In a Toyota Corolla, especially I think that was a 70-something, it was one of the early Corollas, there wasn't much space to be had, period. You know, I think the back shelf of that car, the back window was about this big. So when my brother and I were riding together, there's not much space to fight over, but we fought over what was there. But now when we take a trip... You know, there's these things to keep the kids occupied. We download movies for them so they have movies on their iPod or their tablet or some kind. They have earbuds so they can not have to listen to the other one breathing. But traveling at the time when Paul and Timothy were traveling was just walking. And they traveled thousands and thousands of miles just walking. And you know when you don't have those earbuds and you don't have that phone constantly dinging that you're checking, 
You actually talk to one another while you walk. And so Timothy and Paul got to know one another pretty well. And I'm sure that as they traveled, there were pieces of Paul's story that no one but Timothy would know. And I'm sure there are many parts of, Paul's, of Timothy's story that nobody but Paul would know. They traveled together thousands and thousands of miles. Mostly walking. Sometimes by ship. And those ship rides were often terrifying as Paul says that he was shipwrecked at least four times. And we're guessing that Timothy was with him at least three of those times. They kind of got to know each other pretty well. And as the end approaches for Paul, he really wants to see his son one more time. But he doesn't know if it's going to happen. The last time that they were together, Paul told Timothy in what we read earlier, I remember your tears as we parted. And Paul wants Timothy to know it's going to be okay. I'm not going to survive, but there's something so much better waiting for me. Together, as Paul was writing this letter, as Timothy was reading this letter, they are remembering. They remember that they had stories before they met. Their lives weren't consumed with one another. They, Paul had a very long story before he met Timothy. Timothy had a short story before he met Paul. But their lives had, had merged, intersected, and they had many adventures together. Whether it would have been those rides on the ships and the shipwrecks, or the many times that they thought the ship was going to wreck but didn't. Whether it was the nights where they were traveling together and Paul says that they were attacked by robbers, but they survived. They had so many adventures together that they were, I'm sure, remembering. The places that they had visited. As Timothy and Paul traveled to all of the major cities in the known world at that time together. The churches that they had planted. The believers that they had met. The lessons that they had learned together. They remembered. There's a lot of life that these two lived together. Because they really did share life. As we look at this letter this morning, I've got a couple questions for us to ponder. Where do you think Timothy would have been without the Apostle Paul? This is one of those absolutely unknowns. We'll never know the answer to this question. But, but from what we've told this morning, the story that we have looked at, would Timothy have ever left Lystra? Would we, 2,000 years later, be talking about a young man named Timothy if he had not met Paul? Another question is, where would Paul have been without Barnabas? Without Barnabas' willingness to take the Apostle Paul to the Apostles and say, I know that you don't trust this guy, but he's okay. Where would Paul have been without Barnabas? Where would Paul have been if Barnabas hadn't gone to him and said, come and join me in Antioch. Let's lead this church together. Where would Paul, would we even know his name? And then the greater question is, what would the church look like without Barnabas and Paul and Timothy? When you think about the fact that all of Paul's letters would never have been written, the book of Luke, which was written by another traveling companion of Paul. The book of Acts, which is the sequel to the book of Luke, would never have been written without Barnabas investing in Paul. Without Paul reaching out to the church. I 
I want to ask you this question. Who has God used to invest in your life? Now, for some of you here today, you, man, you've got names that just jump up immediately when I ask that question. For me, I've got names that jump up immediately. I've got faces. I, I know my, my Sunday school teachers when I was growing up, my best friend's parents, they taught my Sunday school class, I think, from at least the fourth grade through early high school. I have a clue that it was because no one else would take a class with both, both me and their son in it. Because we had a reputation. I can remember the days when we had other teachers and we would run off and find the corners of the church to play in while Sunday school was going on. All the rambunctious stuff that we would do. But I can remember how they invested in my life. Taking, taking me in not just to church on Sundays, but every Sunday afternoon, I was either at his parents' place or he was at my parents' place. Most of the time, his parents, because his family had about 100 acres and we could get out of their hair. The phrase was used frequently. And we would go and ride the four-wheelers or we would go down to one of the ponds and we would swim, and, or not swim, it was, but we would tip the canoe. Yeah, so we'd have to get out. I can remember their investment in my life. I don't remember much of what they taught me in Sunday school. But I remember their investment in my life. And I can think of other people who have invested in my life throughout the years. Who's invested in your life? Who has God used to invest in your life up to this point? And the next question is whose life is God using you to invest in now. Who are you reaching out to now? Who are you investing in? As the worship team comes and as we prepare to close, I just want you to ponder those questions. Who invested in you? And who are you willing to invest in? The truth is that for some here today, you may say, Pastor, nobody ever invested in me. The follow-up question to that is, do you wish that someone would have? And I think the answer is yes. Who are you willing to invest in so that someone else doesn't say, nobody ever invested in me? As we prepare to close, we're going to use our my favorite closing song, I Refuse. And I just want you to ask the question, who invested in me? And who am I investing in? And if I'm not investing in anybody, am I willing to invest in someone? Let's stand together. to close my eyes and act like everyone's all right when I know they're not. This world needs God, but it's easier to stand and watch. I could say a prayer and just move on like nothing's wrong. But I refuse Cause I don't want to live like I don't care I don't want to say another empty prayer Oh, I refuse to sit around and wait for someone else To do what God has called me to do myself Oh, I could choose not to move But I refuse hear the least of these crying out so desperately and I know we are the hands and feet of you oh good 
So if you say move, it's time for me to follow through and do what I was meant to do and show them who you are. Cause I don't Heavenly Father, as we ponder the writings of Paul in this last letter that he wrote, we're so thankful for the investment that he made in Timothy. And we're so thankful for the investment that Barnabas made in him. And we're thankful for the investment that people have made into our lives. And I pray that you will speak to us clearly about who we are to invest in that the investments that have been passed on to us would not be squandered or wasted, but we would continue to invest in Your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you are dismissed. For those of you who would like to stay for our annual meeting, we'll take about a 10-minute break, and then we'll reconvene here in the sanctuary. And it shouldn't take long, maybe 10-15 minutes at most.